Nice guy drove down from Nashville the other day and dropped off a couple of very nice amps. We're going to start with this one because it may need the least to work. Uh, we hope so. This is, he believes, a 1960 Fender Deluxe, and it's had work done previously. It's got a good quality grounded power cable. He's been using it. It's safe to turn on. He wants to know what work was done, the level of the work that was done. This may be a, hey, yeah, everything's great, or everything's okay, this one or two things. Or this could be, you know, one of those videos that everyone goes, oh my God, it's full of... Anyway, let's, uh, let's find out. Let's just power it on first. Got the volumes off, the tones midway, and I've got the intensity off. Uh, while I've got uh, that happening, let's check and see where this lines up. Okay, so they're lining up with a... That one almost goes to the one of the 10. This one's not aligned, so the knobs are not aligned. I like to make sure that they're all exactly the same when they go back. So uh, if you turn it to three, it's actually three in comparison to channel to channel. Well, I don't hear a big noise for anything. We'll check the tubes. Let's see what the volumes are sounding like. That all sounds okay. That pot probably needs a little bit of cleaning. It may clean itself just by me turning it a few times like this. I don't always have to use deoxid or other cleaning solvents. I tend to use fader lube more than D5 on pots, but so I always prefer just to turn them a few times first. The volume there had a bit of the scratchies, but that's cleaned itself up as well with a little bit of turning. It's not a bad thing on the subject for you to go to your amps and turn all the knobs a few times like this, maybe every month or two. Because if, if an amp sits for a year and you never turn these knobs, the pots kind of collect a lot of dust on the inside in that one location. So if you just turn them once in a while, it helps keep that from happening. I hear the noise varying with the intensity and the speed. That's good. Let's plug a guitar in and get a general sense of the health of these two, two different channels. Start with the normal. And because the mic is here up two feet from the speaker, I'm not going to be blasting it all. If, you know, at the end, when I'm sure that everything's 100%, I'll do a high volume test. That hum is a single coil. Promising, promising. Much brighter than I would expect. But then I got the volume really low where that's going to have the most effect. All that seems really, really promising. Let's turn this thing around and take a look at it. All right, I got a Weber Classic Alnico. We'll see which model in a little bit. It's got the original uh, speaker plug here. Seems to be a replacement fuse holder, but it's the correct kind. I think it's plastic, not phenolic or Bakelite, but should be fine. Let's take this panel off and see what we see. To everyone who panics at the sight of power tools on these things, I was removing screws with that at a low torque, low speed setting. I put them back by hand. That's where the damage would occur. But I also know my tools and the torque uh, settings very well. 
not as far as uh, some ISO certified torque setting, but I I know where to turn things to get safe results. So which Weber is this? So it's probably a 12A125 or 150. Yeah, 12A125, 8 ohm. So that's correct. There's no text on this GZ34 tongue saw 6V6s. Old GE 7025 there. Another one here. Another one here. That's a very nice thing to see in these. Actually, I'm going to put these back on so that when I put these on the bench, they're not likely to get knocked into anything accidentally while I set things up. If I were to damage a tongue stall, a tongue stall 6v6 current production, I'll buy them some new ones, but I don't want to damage three good working um, GE 7025s. Again, low speed, low torque. That's our friend. Of interest, September 1964 and this 64 stamp and this 64, there's almost no way this is a 1964 fender. This has got to be 60, 61, maybe 62, uh, unless it's just sitting around and they didn't ship it out. You know, if it is just a holdover that they eventually sold to some music store. And there's also a 64, uh, September 28th, 64 stamp, might be 23rd or 26th. I'd have to squint closer. Anyway, end of September 1964 date stamp uh, added on top of the tube chart, which is unusual. And the owner and I both suspect that this is an earlier amp that went back to the Fender factory in September of 64 for some kind of service. Let's take a look and see what that might have been. Well, the mystery just gets curiouser and curiouser. We've got a date code of 1960 on this output transformer. We've got a date code of 1965 on this power transformer. The stamps on the back of the chassis say 64. Uh, maybe this came in for one level of service in 64 and then got a factory replaced Schumacher power transformer some point after, in or after 1965. Very interesting. I have to look at the connections on that on the other side. Let's see what weights us underneath the doghouse. I've taken the screws off to save you some zzz, zzz, zzz sounds, but I've not looked underneath it yet. This looks worse than it is, though this is not a, a great job. You can see how is not this massive caps is not really supported anywhere. And you've got wires kind of going places. What they've done is this amp originally had one capacitor here rated for X number of volts. And the previous tech decided that it was too close to the voltage capability of the cap in question. So he's, he or she has put in a series connection here. And this resistor is across this cap. And there's a resistor down here across this uh, cap. And uh, the hot and negative are joined down here. And this is ugly, but functional. Uh, I will measure the voltages and see if I agree with that determination of series. And I may, I'll probably redo that a little more prettily, but there's nothing, it, it looks ugly, but it, it's actually not a bad solution. If they had given it some mechanical support with some more silicone, it would be better. The others are stock, uh, Sprague Adams, so you can see that they were, uh, twisted around the old leads and soldered. Not my preference. You've got the old existing droppers. The 2 watt here, this model did not have a choke. So there's a resistor here instead of, instead of a choke. And then one watts. Yeah, I'll speak to the owner and I'll measure the voltage here. I'm not trying to say, oh, someone else did this, therefore it must go. It's not that pretty. And while I have ranted about IC brand caps, as used in the Fender reissue series, etc. IC, as an Illinois capacitor, makes a couple of different ranges of capacitors at different quality points. Fender chooses the cheapest, lowest hour, lowest temperature rated. I'll look up this model and see what this is rated for. This, these may be fine, fine capacitors and just need a little bit more silicone to be stable, but I'm not 100% thrilled with how close the, the lead of the uh, resistor on this side comes to chassis. Anyway, let's take a look inside. Okay, so this is weird. 
We've got a 1960 date code on the output transformer. The power transformer, the original is long gone. It's got a replacement from 65. It's got a 1964 date code stamped on there before the 65 power transformer. We've got what seem to be factory original blue Ajax caps. Those came in in 1962. What year was this amp first made? It's very hard to tell. I don't see any date code on the uh, Astron on the um, bias cap. I will pull these pots midway through this repair and see if I can get a pot date code because the pots seem to be original. But it's possible that the pots were changed in 64. I don't know what year this amp is. Have not run into this before. These cathode bypass caps are not original to the amp, and they were not put in at the Fender factory, not only because of the later vintage of them, but because they are all just laid over the existing solder joints and tack solder. These are crappily installed, holding up, but not trustworthy. Time for them to go away. Everything else looks quite nice as far as the stuff on the, on the board and the pots. Um, let me show you two things that stand out. Three, three things that stand out. Ah, ah, ah. A very gray, not very good looking solder joint here where the tail resistor and the cathode resistor and the grid links and the phase inverter meet. That's been touched up poorly and that needs to be redone. There's an air bubble there and that solder joint, that's the negative feedback resistor, which there's a wire underneath here, which goes over to here. The air bubble can hide bad work. And the wire here uh, from the screen, uh, the phase inverter supply going to these two plate resistors, that wire is physically breaking in its solder joint and needs to be reflowed. You can, I don't know if it's apparent to the camera, but to the eye, you can see a little hole, a little semicircle around this, most of the circumference of that wire. It's just partially connected. So that'll get touched up. Of more concern to me is the original uh, bypass cap here in the bias and this changed out resistor here with an absolutely terrible, horrible, no good, very bad solder joint here where I can see that kind of uh, hole making a circle around this lead. I could probably pull this resistor up just by pulling at it pretty severely. Uh, I would just reflow this, but I need to change this cap out at the same time. Interestingly to me, the power transformer from 1965 has a bias tap, which is here, and it is unused, a bias secondary, but the amp is still using the derived secondary, you know, the derived bias supply off the HT secondary. So it's got, probably going to have 100K there versus the 470 ohm. And uh, I will measure the raw AC voltage here and see which way is the better way to go, using the bias tap like later deluxes or using the old non-biased tap like this original deluxe probably six one half dozen of the other and i can leave it as is i would like to put some heat shrink on that just in case that were to touch the uh, metal on on the inside of the cabinet on the top and like i've done on a lot of other deluxes and other fenders that don't have already from the factory uh, the hum balance resistors i'll lift the heater supply heater center tap the physical center tap on the primary, sorry, I can't talk today. The physical heater slash filament uh, secondary center tap. I'll lift that from this connection here, tape it off like I'll tape off, heat shrink off the, uh, the unused bias tap and put in some 100 ohm resistors. So if there's a fault in the, uh, in the uh, heater supply at some point, it'll burn two resistors rather than making this thing go to its third power transformer. That screw there on that bias board is, is way up too. That's not been tight in a long time. You can see here when they changed out this transformer, they soldered on top of the old ground for the center taps here. This is the HT center tap in red, the, the filament center tap in green and yellow. Red and yellow, I guess it is. Anyway, um, so they've not merged that. It's You can see the old solder joint and the new solder joint. By old, I mean 1960, and new, I mean 1965, or slightly thereafter, most likely. You can see here on the replaced power cord that they have the hot going to the fuse, and they are switching the neutral. That is a big no-no. They have disconnected the old polarity switch and death cap. 
but uh, this is not how you do safety wiring. And as I've said in many, many videos, if you have a captive cable like this, rather than an IEC, the ground must be longer than the hot and the neutral for safety reasons. So all this will get redone. So I'm gonna reflow this one really bad solder joint here in the bias connection. Because I don't want that to come loose on my watch. Boy, that's yucky, yucky old solder in there. That's much better. And I'm going to, I'll redo this entirely later. And I'm going to use my Variac to set the incoming voltage to 120 volts AC because it's about 116 out of the wall. 120.7, that's good enough for right now. I'm going to power it on without, without the power tubes. And I'm going to see what the unloaded B plus is as the tube comes up, the rectifier tube. So with no output tubes to pull it down, it's about 476. 476 unloaded with the GZ34. I don't think there's any reason to use series caps on this because that means that the loaded voltage is going to be closer to 440, depending on how the bias is set. Um, the, the worst case was powering it up uh, without output tubes and no load there. So 476, I can use a 500 volt rated cap, no problem, because without those tubes in place, the current at that setting is so low that it doesn't matter that it's 476 volts on a 500 volt cap if there's almost no current. By the time there's any real current, that voltage is going to drop down to the 440s, worst case, probably. Uh, even if it's 450, it's going to be fine as far as the uh, caps go. So there's no need for that series connection unless they're playing this someplace where the wall voltage exceeds 130. And I think the owner of this amp knows better than to do that. Anyway, uh, I know what to do. I know what my mar marching orders are. I want to put all the stuff in the doghouse back to how it was originally, clean. And with the owner's permission, I'd like to replace those 2-watt and 1-watt carbon comps or some uh, modern stuff that's gonna be better suited for the power supply. And I'm gonna rebuild uh, this section of the bias supply, at least re change out this cap. I'll probably revisit what this resistor is. I'll talk to the owner, see if he wants a variable bias or whether me just to set that so that with X wall voltage, it'll be in the desired range with different tubes. I wanna replace the AC power wiring as shown I'm gonna go through there and touch up those little, those three solder joints I showed on the board. I'm going to uh, change out those three cathode bypass caps that were just tack soldered in. And at that point, we'll see how the amp is sounding. But uh, this should be a great result for not a lot of work. Now the amp already sounds okay. It's going to sound better when everything is refreshed and peace of mind is worth a lot. It's not a lot of labor to get this thing to peace of mind. And as this thing is already on its second power transformer, I think uh, let's get this good and lock it in and make it last the way it is. Before I end this first video on this very unusual version of a very rare amp, I also want to point out this little copper shield here on the input jacks for this channel. Later fenders lacked that, that just a little strip of copper soldered to the big brass control panel. And it just shields these inputs from the stuff here. That's kind of cool. Probably not necessary, but it shows what they were trying. I like finding stuff like that. The geek in me gets overwhelmed with, with geeky joy. I hope videos like this also bring geeky joy to others. As always, thanks for watching.